following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Welcome. We'll begin today's lecture when we begin our lectures we generally dive uh, directly into a topic and explore a, a given theme based upon whatever is occurring to the instructor as being of value to the students. And sometimes it's easy for, for us as listeners to slip into our old habits of taking that information, the, the explanations that are given, or the knowledge that's explained, the way we have taken other words and other information that we've received from other sources. In other words, we are receptive in a mechanical way. It's important for us as students of this tradition to keep in mind the foundation of this school and the wisdom that we're studying. The foundation of this tradition is based in the consciousness. Our foundation is not found in the physical world. In other words, in order to receive Gnosis, to understand Gnosis, to comprehend the nature of the lectures and the books. We have to be utilizing the consciousness as our primary tool, not the intellect, not the mind. And the consciousness utilized in this way as our primary receiver and interpreter of the Gnostic doctrine receives the impressions through the senses but digests them in the heart. And this is the critical thing that we have to develop in ourselves, something that, that we may not even know how to do today. You see, Gnosis is a heart doctrine. It is a doctrine of the heart, from the heart, about the heart, and for the heart. So I invite 
you as a listener, as a student, as someone who's investigating Gnosis, to make that effort to receive the knowledge with the intellect as well, but to work more to receive the knowledge with your heart. To take it intuitively, not intellectually. And there's a reason for that. There's an importance to that. That's something very hard to explain and that must be experienced. And that's really why we call it Gnosis. This tradition or this, this science that we study could have many names and has had many names in the past. In India, it has been studied under hundreds of different names and schools and traditions. In Tibet, in China, throughout Asia, in South America, Central America, all over the world. Same knowledge, the same science, the same teaching, but called different things. The reason that we rely upon the word gnosis instead of something else is because this word implies very directly not only its source, but how it must be received by us. And this is because gnosis refers to experiential knowledge. A kind of intuitive understanding, not intellectual understanding. And I say that in a way of, of explaining a difference that as beginners we need to grasp. Because the intellect can also be intuitive. But in the beginning, this is not easy to, to comprehend. We tend to reside so much in the intellect, we don't even realize that we're in the intellect. Because we're so accustomed to it. You see, the intellect that we have is that psychological device that compares. It takes one thing and compares it to another thing. And then it makes a judgment. When we were children going to school, we arrived at school with a certain set of experiences that we had acquired at home. And then we start to hear new things from our teachers and our friends we're put into a conflict of comparing these often contradictory sets of information. The knowledge that we've received from our parents or our siblings would be in contradiction to what we're told by our friends at school, by our teachers. And this is where we start to find the intellect comes into play so much. When usually when we're six, seven, eight years old. And we become very accustomed to resolving all of our conflicts with that same mechanism. Comparing data, information. One set of information with another set. And then we try to judge based on that sensory data. And this is what the intellect does. And at the same time in our life, we were in the process of developing our personality. And the personality is called uh, that because it's our persona, which means mask. And through those ages, we're developing our way of relating to other people and the world. And as we developed our personality through that tender period of time, and also became so reliant on the intellect, we have in turn, as a result, generally developed a personality that relies upon the intellect. 
So our personality itself, the way we relate to the world, the way we relate to others, tends towards being intellectual. This is the general tendency. It's not in every case. But in most cases, we find this tendency is very prevalent, very strong. This is why when we become adults, we have passed through the period of time from more or less 14 to 21, where we develop the heart. We pass through that without really developing the heart. Because our intellect and our personality were made so strong and impacted with so much trauma from 7 to 14 that we rely upon that mechanism to protect ourselves. And that period of 7 to 14, be, being very intellectual and being a person in development, when we hit 14 to 21 and we have all those intense emotional experiences and sexual experiences that are very hard for us to comprehend, especially because they are not intellectual. They're emotional. They're related to the heart. And we, if we reach those traumas, those challenges, those contradictions, and we don't get good guidance. We don't get good information from our parents and our teachers and our friends and our siblings that we immediately fall back on the intellect again because the heart is confused. The heart is in conflict. So then we start looking in religion. We start looking in magazines and in books. We start listening to the arguments and justifications of our friends and our doctors and our priests, all of whom enforce upon us more information, more intellect, always with reasons and justifications. Reasons and justifications designed to enforce belief. If this sounds complex, it is. It's very complex. That's the nature of our psyche. It's complicated. Not by nature, but by consequence. The psyche that we have is not as it should be. Psyche means soul. Psyche is our psychological state, our soul state. When we reach adulthood, having passed through these varieties of traumas and difficulties managing so many complex and contradictory emotions and ideas and beliefs, we generally arrive at adulthood with a fractured, limping, very weak psychological mechanism. In a place where we like to think one thing, but that one thing is easily contradicted. So we're constantly changing our beliefs, our friends, our religion, we're having traumas or struggles or conflicts in family and home, at work, and life is very complicated. It's very rare to find someone with a stable life, with stable friendships, stable family situation, stable job situation. Because as individuals, we are not stable. And this is reflected in our society. Our society is what it is because of the individuals who constitute it. Our society is in turmoil on every level because as individuals, we are in turmoil. Our society is contradictory and complicated and in conflict because we are those things as individuals. Then we come to Gnosis, or any religion, wanting answers, wanting to know how do we resolve the pain 
that we feel in our psyche. And that pain is largely emotional. But we don't know how to deal with that pain because we never developed good intuitive emotional tools. We developed intellectual ones. So we try to solve emotional problems with intellectual tools, and that doesn't work. It's the same thing as trying to cut down a tree with a pair of scissors. You're using the wrong tool for the job. Or better yet, to cut down a tree with a spoon, because you use a spoon in the kitchen, right? So it's different. It's not for that purpose. So returning to where I started, Gnosis is a doctrine of the heart. It is a heart doctrine. It is for the heart. It must be received by the heart. It must be digested by the heart and understood there intuitively. Students who have been attending Gnostic lectures for a period of time may have found that, that uh, Gnosis is bewildering to the intellect. And there are certain instructors, I won't name any names, who like to teach in a way that the intellect cannot digest. The intellect cannot grasp because there's so many levels and layers and interconnected elements that the intellect is stupefied. And for some students, this is too intense and too much because they become so habituated to intellectualizing everything that they cannot digest something in any other way. And without an intellectual grasp, they leave because they don't feel a sense of security. And this is unfortunate. Because the intellect can never provide genuine security. The mind can never provide security. Because the mind is only a machine. And a machine does not last forever. A machine is just a mechanism to transform something, and that's it. And it can only do a certain job, and that's it, and nothing more. And that's all the intellect is. So people who come to Gnosis, the way they've come to studying in school or studying in other types of traditions, see the contradictory, the complicated, the vast intellectual aspect of Gnosis and become overwhelmed and find so many contradictions to what they already have been told or believe that they can't digest it and leave. And again, it's because they're relying on that old tool of comparing with the intellect. So, for example, they may have been raised in a Hebrew Jewish household or a Christian household. And then they hear a Gnostic lecture that uses some of the same words but totally contradicts what they grew up with. So they become offended, angry, maybe afraid. Maybe they laugh. But because they all receive that with the mind, they cannot resolve the meaning. They don't see the truth of what's being said because they don't receive it with the heart, consciously. What I'm explaining here has a very important significance. If you are a sincere person, who sincerely wants to change. If you're someone who sincerely wants to change the nature of your experience of life, <clears throat> to really and seriously and definitively transform suffering, then it is beholden upon you to put the intellect in its place to put it in its place, to use it where it's needed, but not use it where it should not be. Gnosis, first and foremost, is not intellectual. 
But unfortunately, we have this tendency to take it into the mind and to take it as a structure or a dogma that we should believe in or accept and then follow. But this is wrong. This is the wrong approach. As instructors, we don't want you to believe. And most of all, we don't want you to follow. This is not what we want. What we want is for you to find Gnosis yourself. It would be a disappointment for us as instructors for you to listen to a thousand lectures and believe everything and accept everything and yet have no experience of it. This would be a real disappointment. Mostly for yourself. Because from mere acceptance or belief, no change can arise. Change comes through action, not belief. You can believe whatever you want. And we respect that. You have every right to believe anything you like. And as instructors, every Gnostic instructor will respect that. Yet, if you want to grasp Gnosis, to taste Gnosis, to know what it is, you have to abandon those beliefs. Even beliefs in Gnosis. You have to abandon it. Because a belief is a cage. A belief, a theory, an idea, is a cage for the mind. It is a cage for the soul. This is true no matter where you come from, no matter what tradition you feel attracted towards. If you merely believe in it, but do not act, you are dead. It is through action that we discover the reality, the truth, the gnosis the experiential knowledge, the facts. And this is what we try to emphasize in these lectures. We utilize scripture, the words of prophets, in order to enlighten our understanding, in order to develop the powers of the heart. But once again, it's very easy to fall back into intellectualism. To merely accept or reject, believe or disbelieve. But we need to keep aware of that tendency that we have. We need to keep aware of the tendency that we have to put the mind in cages. And it's a tendency we have because of fear. because we are deeply afraid. We have a vacuum in our heart. We don't know how to use the heart. And because of that vacuum, we try to find security in the mind, in the intellect, in ideas, in the superficial levels of the heart, which are where we have just beliefs. So many times we find that people who are very aggressive about their particular belief system, which could be religion, could be science. They can be very aggressive, fanatical about it, precisely because they are so terribly afraid. That fear drives them to be very aggressive, pushy, loving to argue and debate, to try to convince others in order to make them feel like, well, everybody else here with me agrees, so it must be true. This is all to cultivate a false sense of security, to develop a security in a belief 
or a religion or a movement or a technique. And this is widespread all over the world. People who call themselves Hindu, Christian, Buddhist, and Gnostic. Who clutch so desperately to that name and garb themselves in it as if it were a suit of armor. All the while not realizing that they're leaving the real problem untouched. That problem is in their own heart. It's fear. And it's fear because of lack of experience. We fear death because we don't know what happens at death. We have not remembered that experience. And through Gnosis, this teaching, we teach you how to recollect all the many times that you've already died. So that then with that experience, instead of being afraid, then you realize it's not a big deal. The mere process of death is the same as the process of going to sleep. The soul steps out of the body, is active in another level of nature, and then steps back into the body. But with death, it just happens to be a new body instead of the same one. This is not to say that death is unimportant. It's very important. But our fear of it is unwarranted. And it's there because of ignorance. Because we don't have the conscious experience of remembering what it's like to be out of the physical body. We think we are the body. And that's why we're afraid. We think that when this body dies, we might go to heaven, we might go to hell, or we might go nowhere. We don't know. So we're afraid. So we grasp onto things. Then we come into a given religion, could be even Gnosis, and we hear about all these terrible things that are supposed to happen after we die. Going to Klipoth or hell, the Averno. Or we hear about all the prophecies of how the earth's going to be destroyed and there's going to be atomic war and a lot of suffering. And we become terribly afraid. Overwhelmed with fear, quaking with fear. And what does our personality want? Security. So we attach ourselves to a religion or a teaching or a person who promises us safety. In other words, we want to be one of the chosen people. The ones who will be saved from the great catastrophe. The ones who will be saved from death. The ones who will resurrect after death. The ones who will ascend to heaven. And so we may be Mormon or a Brahmin or a Sufi. But we have our special group, and we have our important teacher, and we believe we are one of the few who will be saved. And we believe that all of the other billions of people who also think they're going to be saved are wrong, and we happen to be right. I'm sorry to have to say it this, this way to you, but that is pride. And it is pride rooted in fear, and it is a lie. It is a self-deceit. It is self-deception. It doesn't matter what group you belong to. And it doesn't matter who you follow. You can say and believe whatever you want. What matters is what you do. How you act. How you use your mind and your heart. You can be a Buddhist. You can be a Hindu, a Christian, a Gnostic, it doesn't matter. What matters is the actions you perform and the consequences you create and how those fit in to the overall scheme of matter and energy. You see, everything in the, in, that is manifested is just variations of prana, 
forces, energies. What matters is how we utilize energy. You see, we teach a technique called pranayama, which means harnessing the winds, the vital forces, energy. But that practice of pranayama is not just a breathing exercise. The entire teaching is a teaching of pranayama, to harness energy, to direct forces. That's why we call this teaching Tantra. Tantra means stream or continuum or flow. Many people think Tantra is just about sex. It is not. It's part of it. Tantra is about how to use energy, how to harness energy and use it. And unfortunately for us, because we've become enslaved by our fear, by our bad habits psychologically. We use our energies in order to cultivate a false sense of security and to feed desire. We want to feel good. We want to feel safe. We want to feel saved. We want to feel protected. We want to feel special. We want to feel different. We want to feel better than others. We want to feel loved. All of these are because of the heart. All of them. Not the mind. But we fall into the mind to try to solve the problems of the heart. To resolve this conflict, we need to develop new skills. And this is why we emphasize repeatedly again and again and again to learn how to balance the three brains. And the only way you can do that is to awaken your own consciousness by paying attention. Not just every once in a while, but constantly. And that attention is not directed all outside. It's mostly directed inside. So that you have a split sense of awareness. You're able to perceive and watch and be aware of the external events that are happening, but also simultaneously perceive and watch and observe the internal reactions, the state of consciousness that you have. And to aid us in that, we have a lot of knowledge to study, a lot of books and a lot of scripture. And because this effort to awaken consciousness is so difficult, because we're so lazy, and we want to feel safe, and we want to just put on autopilot and coast all the way to heaven, we repeatedly fall back into the mistake of intellectualizing and believing. So awakening the consciousness from moment to moment is super critical. And utilizing our energies in an effective and and beneficial way is also super critical. But they're both a waste of time if we're doing it all intellectually. If we're doing it with the mind, not the heart. This is the difference. I'm sorry to say as well to you that you might find in the course of your experience with a teaching like this. Students, instructors, who may have a good intellectual grasp of the teaching and who may transform their energies, but who have no intuitive understanding at all. In other words, they have taken the doctrine of the heart into themselves through the mind, through the personality, and have made it a doctrine of the eye, in terms of the eyes that we use in our head. A sensual doctrine, a materialistic doctrine, concrete 
dogmatic, mechanical. And when you find students or instructors or schools or, or systems like this, they tend to be very rigid. Very rigid. Because that is how the intellect is. And that is how the personality is. It's very rigid. Very strict. Very fanatical. And very contradictory. And has a lot of very beautiful and clever justifications for itself. You'll find this in any religion. We, we can easily observe cases of Christian churches, groups of Buddhists, groups of Muslims. In any tradition, schools and teachers and students who believe very much and have very good intentions and really try to follow their teaching but without the heart, without intuition, without consciousness. They might even meditate for hours a day. They might transmute their sexual energy. They might speak beautifully of love, patience, and tolerance. But in their actions, they are intolerant, cruel, and asleep. And this is true around the world. It's also true in Gnosis. We can avoid these problems if in the beginning, as students, we control our mind. We control our personality. And we rely on the powers of our heart. This is not an easy thing to do. Especially because when we first discover a teaching like this, our heart is very weak and sick and in a lot of pain, even if we don't see it. And this is why we have so much vulnerability and so much discomfort and insecurity in life, but especially about opening up and revealing our true self, our real pain, our real struggles. We like to put on a good face act strong, act tough, act like we're on top of it, but inside, we're not like that. And to study Gnosis, to grasp Gnosis, we have to get past that. Not in public, but with ourselves. To be sincere with oneself. This is the beginning. If we're really sincere with ourselves, and really apply the teaching sincerely through our heart, Gnosis becomes a living thing, vibrant, alive, very flexible and intuitive. It is not rigid. It is not strict and limited. It is not a cage. If you feel that Gnosis is a cage, you have misunderstood it. If you feel that religion is a cage or a bottle or a box, you have misunderstood it. The word religion comes from the word religare in Latin, which means to reunite. This is the same as the Sanskrit yug, which is where yoga comes from, which means to harness, to bring back together things that have become separated. This is the meaning of yoga, to reunite to bring back things to make them one again. That element that we need to reunite is our own psyche. Our psyche has fallen asleep and is alone and defenseless and in pain. In order for us to accomplish the goal of true religion, yoga, we need to first realize what that is in us. Our own psyche, our own consciousness, our soul. This has nothing to do with belief. It is something that is here and now. It is here and now. 
Don't think that maybe one day you will taste and experience your soul. You are that. The soul is who you are. But to become the soul is another thing. Because we are only embryos. We are Buddhadatadatu or Tathagatagarbha, essence, Buddha nature. We have the seed, the embryo of a soul. That is what we are. And that can become a full fledged soul, an awakened consciousness, a Buddha. We're not that yet. But we are a soul, that seed. And you can taste and experience that now, but not if you're in your intellect and hiding in the cage of the mind and hiding in that cage of personality that clutches to your name and history and belief and religion and all the things that you like to tell yourself. If you remain in that cage, that is all you will ever know. that cage that has whatever name and history that you carry. If you want to know something more, you have to abandon it. You have to step out of your own cage. And that's scary. It's terrifying. It's very, very shocking to see the truth of oneself. But just like when you learn to ride a bicycle, once you've learned it, it's nice. It's not so scary anymore. You learn how to balance. You learn how to ride. And then you can feel the wind. Then you have no fear. You see, when you're centered in the consciousness, experiencing the consciousness, using the consciousness, there is no fear there. The consciousness knows no fear because it is connected to God. And when we have that connection in us, alive and vibrant and present, there's nothing to be afraid of, not even death. Nothing. Then you feel that feeling that we've been searching for our whole life. Serenity, contentment, peace. So this is not something you arrive at through belief or through the intellect. And really, this is what all of the great teachers and prophets have been trying to explain to us for millennia. Sometimes directly, sometimes symbolically. In most cases, they've tried to explain it intuitively through the language of consciousness in order to encourage us to develop that skill. When things are explained to us literally, we don't appreciate it. But when we arrive at something intuitively from our own understanding, it's very important to us. It means something. And that's part of the great beauty and power of real religion is it shows you the door to gain that experience for yourself. And having gained it, you're not the same. And you can't go back. Because you know. That's gnosis. And that's in any religion. That can be experienced anywhere, anytime. In history and in the future. That will always be the case. But it's only access through the present moment. So our prophets and our saints and our teachers have tried through scriptures and books and many ways to encourage us to learn that language of intuition, which is something symbolic, not literal. And that's why we teach the way we do in these lectures. We explain a little more about those scriptures and about those symbols so that we can get over the intellect, so that we can put the intellect to the side. We can tell the intellect, okay, here is the explanation. Will you shut up now? 
so we can get to the real story. The real story is personal. The real deal, the real meat is in our own heart. It's useful and good and interesting to grasp and understand and hear the intellectual teaching, but it is not the point. It's not the purpose. It's not the goal. The goal is self-change, self-development. We want to change life, our experience of life, and that way we can change for the better of others. For us to do that, we need to start changing. And that's why we have a heart doctrine. It's a doctrine that teaches us to use the heart to return back to the skills and powers of the heart to be connected once more with our own inner divinity. Because only from there can we initiate a true revolution psychologically in ourselves. Anything you try to do in the mind will fail because the mind can always be contradicted. The instant you make any religion, any teaching, any doctrine, any practice an intellectual one, it's a curious law of nature that that thing will immediately be contradicted by an equal and opposite force. We don't realize that. But this is how nature manages energy. It's a law of physics, and it applies to belief and intellect. We have to escape that duality. And that can only happen through the heart. So when we study scripture, we study Gnosis, we have to use the heart. To not read literally, but read intuitively. And not read scripture like it applies to everyone else, but that it applies to us. And this is the other thing we do, especially if we're a strong believer in something. <clears throat> we'll read the words of a prophet who describes how all the unbelievers must fall before the sword of God or we must you know, conquer the unbelievers, these kind of things. And we always think it applies to everyone else. We're a believer, so it doesn't apply to us. Or we read you know, in Revelation about how those who are marked with the seal of the devil will go to the abyss, and those who are marked with the seal of the living God will go to heaven. We naturally think, oh, I must have the seal of the living God because I believe in what I'm reading, and I'm a good person, and I, I must be going to heaven, and everybody else is bad, except my loved ones and my dog. But everybody else is going to hell. This is wrong. And as an example of that, I'll read to you a little passage from the book of Isaiah. This chapter, really this whole section of the book, is symbolic and is told in the voice of God. And the voice of God through his prophet. And people read this, and they first think it's something historical that only happened in the past and only relates to things in the past. And second, they think it applies to other people and not us. But that's all wrong. This is a book of Kabbalah. This is a book of Gnosis. This is a book of initiation. This is a very important thing to grasp. Initiation is personal. It has to do with the soul, with the psyche. So it says here in chapter 29, God is speaking. He says, Because that people has approached me with its mouth and honored me with its lips, but has kept its heart far from me, and its worship of me has been a commandment of men learned by rote, Truly, I shall further baffle that people with bafflement upon bafflement, and the wisdom of its wise shall fail, and the prudence of its prudent shall vanish. So you see, this begins with, because
because that people has approached me with its mouth. In other words, I believe and accept Jesus as my Savior. I believe and accept Krishna as my Savior. I believe and accept Osiris or Horus or Amun-Ra or Jehovah or the Nameless One or Buddha. All words. Words. That without action are meaningless. So he says, people have approached me with their mouth and honored me with their lips, but kept their hearts far from me. You see, as much as we accept, believe, and follow, if our heart is not the active ingredient, it is meaningless. God does not accept it. And that God can be called Allah, Enri, Tao, Rhea, Zeus, Jupiter, whatever you want. God is God, no matter what we call it. It is the same thing. So it says further that this people has worshipped God by the commandment of men, or as a commandment of men learned by rote. In other words, as something that men have said and follow. Rules, appearances, behaviors, things that the religion says we're supposed to do and things we're not supposed to do. We should dress a certain way. We should act a certain way. We have to go to church on certain days or go to these or that events and temples and whatever and follow mechanically all those supposed rules and requirements and restrictions that our given tradition enforces upon us. And we believe that by following those things, we will be saved. That's not true. It says it right here. Following by rote the commandments of men does not lead us to heaven. It does not lead us to God. And as punishment for that, God says here, truly, I shall further baffle that people. In other words, God himself will confuse them. I don't know about you, but when I look around the world, the world is very confused. And has been. But it seems to be getting worse. At least to me. And that confusion is perhaps the strongest in religion. Spiritually. People change religions day to day, everywhere. They walk in and out from school to school, from place to place, from sect to sect. Even though they may remain Christian, they move from one church to another. They may remain Buddhist, but they move from one teacher to another. They go from one confusion to another confusion time and again. And worst of all is that all of them are fighting with each other. Each group proclaiming that they are the only true group and proclaiming that all the other ones are false and going to hell or samsara or wherever it is that that particular group might say. So who's right? If everyone believes they're right, who is? And how can you resolve that if you rely upon your intellect? Because your intellect, as soon as it believes one thing, will immediately put in place a contradiction. Because that is the nature of the intellect. It cannot find a single solitary thing, because everything in the intellectual nature is dual. So it says, with bafflement upon bafflement, and the wisdom of its wise shall fail, and the prudence of its prudent shall vanish. How true is this? In religion after religion, church after church, group after group, we see these leaders who rise, who rise, who rise, and become more and more famous and popular, and then all of a sudden it's revealed that they're molesting children. Or they've been doing this or that. 
or that they were never really following the tradition in the first place. This is happening all over the world in every tradition, in every religion, and it's very sad. And it's happening in Gnosis too. This is why Samael and Vior emphasized again and again and again, do not follow anyone. He said it repeatedly, do not follow me. And yet people follow. Because we want to feel saved. We want to feel secure. We want to feel like someone is going to do it for us. We've talked about this before in lectures, and we've called it salvation by association. And it's this subtle assumption that we make that if we associate with the right group or with the right person or the right belief, then we'll be saved just by being associated. It's as if if we're friends with a policeman, we won't get a ticket. We think that if we are with a, a good priest or a good lama or a good master or a person who has been given a lot of titles and has all this recognition and fame, that will be saved. A key example is the Dalai Lama. Dalai Lama is surrounded by many people, and a percentage of them are only there because they want to associate with him, so they have a feeling of security. They go to his teachings, they read his books, they follow his instruction, which is all good. But unfortunately, unless they act themselves, that association is meaningless because the end result will be the same for them. Without producing the consequences that they want, those consequences will not arise. You cannot be saved by association, ever. This is why the wisdom of its wise shall fail and the prudence of its prudence shall vanish. So Isaiah points out repeatedly in many ways the difference between those who remain true to God and those who do not. But what's really interesting about this book is that the unbelievers are his priests. This is the most interesting thing of all. This chapter, which I'm reading from, which is 29, begins, Ah, Ariel, Ariel, city where David camped. Ariel means the Lion of God, which is related with the tribe of Judah, which is the Jews, the real initiates. Not the Jews by blood, but the real Jews who are the initiates or awakened consciousness. The city where David camped, that city, of course, is Jerusalem. So Ariel is a name for Jerusalem. The lion, of course, is symbolic of the force of the law, the force of the White Lodge. And throughout all of our cultures, Greek, throughout the Asian cultures, we see the lion as a symbol of divine majesty and divine might. And you can listen to lectures about Leo or Arcanum 11 to learn more about the lion. But here he's addressing the city of Jerusalem, which is supposed to be the city of God where his people live. But he's addressing them as they are drunkards. He says here, act stupid and be stupefied. Act blind and be blinded. They are drunk, but not from wine. They stagger, but not from liquor. For the Lord has spread over you a spirit of deep sleep and has shut your eyes, the prophets, and has covered your heads, the seers, so that all prophecy has been to you like the words of a sealed document. Further, he says that Let me 
find it. Priest and prophet are muddled by liquor. They are confused by wine. They are dazed by liquor. They are muddled in their visions. They stumble in judgment. Yea, all tables are covered with vomit and filth, so that no space is left. To whom would he give instruction? To whom expound a message? To those newly weaned from milk, just taken away from the breast? That same mutter upon mutter, murmur upon murmur, now here, now there. They refuse to listen. And so they will march, but they shall fall backwards and be injured and snared and captured. You men of mockery who govern that people in Jerusalem, behold, I'm skipping down a little bit. Behold, I will found in Zion, stone by stone, a tower of precious cornerstones, exceedingly firm. He who trusts need not fear. But I will apply judgment as a measuring line and retribution as weights. Hail shall sweep away the refuge of falsehood and flood waters engulf your shelter. So you see, God's talking about building a tower. And while it's true that we can observe these drunken priests and prophets in the outside world, and we can point fingers at many religions and traditions and teachers, this is not why this document was written. This document was written because we have all those things inside of us. Those unbelievers those priests and prophets of the city of Jerusalem are parts of us. The Lord here is our own being, our own God who's within. And the ones who will be punished and drunken and, and destroyed by God are our egos, our fear, our pride, especially our religious pride. These are the priests and prophets. These parts of ourselves that think that we are so good and holy and divine. That think God will save me because I'm good. I may have made mistakes, but God loves me and God will save me. This is what we tell ourselves. This is a lie that we tell ourselves. There are no guarantees. God does not break his own laws. The laws exist for a reason. To ascend to heaven, we have to satisfy the requirements. End of story. Jesus said it. Moses said it. They all said it. None shall come to heaven but he who deserves it. Every man will reap what he sows. We will receive according to our action. <coughs> Jesus said very clearly again and again, no murderer, no idolater, no fornicator, no thief will enter heaven. But every one of us has murderers, adulterers, fornicators, and thieves inside, in our mind. We might not steal physical things, but we might steal mental things. We might steal emotional things. We might steal sexual things. We might steal energy. We might steal attention. We might steal time. God in the book of Isaiah is explaining that the city of Jerusalem is supposed to be the city of God. That's us. Ariel, the lion of God, should be us. We should be a lion of God. You see, Leo rules the heart. Leo has to do with the fires of Arie the lion, which is in the heart. This is the power of the fire in the heart. And that power is a fire of love. Eros. In the Greek mythology, Eros is that first force that arises from the nothingness. Eros. And Eros is incomprehensible. We think of Eros as sex. 
And Eros is the source of sex, but even for the gods. And the gods do not have sex the way we do. For them, it's pure. For them, it is divine. For us, it is not. That force of Eros is Christ. Love. Divine. A kind of love that's incomprehensible. A kind of love that is beyond the mind. This is why the intellect can never grasp this teaching. It has nothing to do with the intellect. When we work to awaken consciousness and develop the powers of the heart, we're seeking to incarnate that fire in the heart, which is the force of the lion. The lion is regal and majestic and intelligent and powerful and dominates nature, rules nature. We don't rule nature. We are enslaved by it. We start to change that by changing our own nature, by commanding our own mind. This is our nature, our kingdom, our city. As it is, our egos are intoxicated are drunken with desire. Feeding their desires. Feeding their lust, their cravings, and trying to avoid pain. And so the consciousness in us, being enslaved, is trapped. And God is saying, I will destroy that city. And only the ones who are faithful in the heart will be saved. Not those who follow the commandments of God or the commandments of men. Not those who speak with their mouth and their lips and say they believe, but the ones who do it through the heart. That's what it says here. The ones who will be destroyed, who will be made confused, who will suffer are the ones who have kept their heart far from God. You see, we don't even know about our heart. We keep our heart even far from us because it's painful. Because we have too much pain. We can't even bear to see the truth of who we are. We can't even bear to see the truth of our own mistakes. We can't even be sincere with ourselves. This is why all over the world, in every aspect and corner of our society, we see everyone pointing fingers at everyone else, but never at themselves. You see, today all the politicians are blaming each other for all the problems, when they are the cause of the problems. We see ourselves, the society, blaming all the politicians, when in fact, we are the ones who voted them in office. We are the ones who created the situation. Everyone is blaming everyone else, but not taking responsibility for themselves. This is the fundamental problem, and we bring that to religion. This is why we interpret scriptures as being about everyone else and not us. We interpret hell as a place everyone else will go, not us. We interpret ego as something everyone else has, but not us. We like to think the best of ourselves. And unfortunately, this is a cause of suffering. The solution is here in this book also. God can build a tower of foundation stones, corner stones. If you've listened to these lectures, you know what that's about. It's quite clear in the scripture. But this tower is not the Tower of Babel. We already have that. Every one of us is a Tower of Babel. We are in confusion. And God is saying in this scripture, through the prophet, those who keep their hearts far from me will become more confused. And this is how we see our world declining into more and more confusion. Because people are not working with the powers of the heart. They're not being sincere with themselves, much less anyone else. 
Sama Alan Vior stated in one of his books that the perfume of sincerity has vanished from the world. And it's true. It's very rare to find a sincere person or a sincere feeling, even in ourselves. Most of the time, we do everything mechanically. One day to the next, no sincerity. This tower that God will build is the celestial Jerusalem. It is the tower that's built in the spinal column, stone by stone. These are the vertebrae of the column. These are the 33 small bones that make up our spinal column, which are the 33 years in the life of Jesus and the 33 degrees of initiation. The heart doctrine is a doctrine of initiation. The process whereby God builds the tower, not us. We do not do it. God builds it. We do our part. We do our part by dying. We do our part through death. This is why we're so afraid of Gnosis, of real religion, because we don't want to die. To us, that's terrifying. We don't know what that means. We think it means non-existence, that we will be in great suffering and pain, that somehow death means the end of all that we know. It's true. It does mean the end of all that we know. But death is the entrance into a new life. Whether that's a mere physical death or psychological. Our part is to die. Those drunken prophets and priests, those diviners and soothsayers in our mind, that Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess, who is our mind, who always tells us what a good person we are, who always tells us that God will save us, that we'll be okay, that everything will work out in the end, that liar who seduces our mind, seduces our psyche to sleep and to follow our desires and to become drunk on the wine of sentimentalism and sensuality. When that Jezebel dies, then the true celestial Jerusalem, which is the soul, can be born. Then that emerges. Then there is salvation. This doesn't come overnight and does not come easily. The way to it is the path of death, psychological death. In other words, everything that you think you are, you have to abandon. In order to become something that you are not, you have to first cease being what you are. In other words, what you are right now is not what you should be. Look at yourself. Is this really what you want? Is the way that you are and the way that you live the ultimate, the best, the full potential of a human being? I can't imagine anybody would say yes. And I'm sure if we were really sincere and remembered and recollected all of our pain, our mistakes, our confusion, we would acknowledge that we are really deeply ignorant. And we really don't know what life can be. But somehow in the depth, in the darkness of the heart, there is a voice, a small, still, quiet murmur that says there is something more. And that's why we seek for religion. That's why we look for God. That is the voice of the heart. That is the voice of intuition. And that's what we need to listen to. It's not easy because the mind is noisy and loud and very stubborn. It's easy to listen to the mind. The mind is right there all the time saying, I want this and I want that and you better do this and that for me or I'm not going to be happy. I want this and that comfort and security and these new toys now. 
This is what our mind says. And our personality says, I want all these things, and I want to be respected, and I want to be liked, and I want to feel safe and saved. But you see, all these things are lies. Unfortunately, we've been perpetuating them every day. For God to build that tower inside of us, we have to provide the elements. We have to mine the depths of ourselves in order to provide to God what he needs to do it. And the only way to do that is through the heart. Not by saying we believe, not by the words we speak with our lips, but through intuitive action in the heart from moment to moment. In other words, there are no guarantees. It's scary, but that's the way life is. When we face it, when we look it in the face, it becomes easier. We're so absorbed in fear that we can't even look at fear. We're so absorbed in our craving for safety and security and a sense of knowing that we can't even look to know for ourselves. We want instead for someone to give us a guarantee. I'm sure all of you would prefer that I tell you, if you just do this practice and pay this much money, you'll go to heaven. Wouldn't that be easier? be nice, but I'd be lying. If you want to hear that, there are plenty of people who will take your money. And I'm sure you will have no trouble finding someone who will tell you exactly what you want to hear. And if that's what you want, I wish you the best of luck. But unfortunately, it is very difficult to escape the cage that we're trapped within. It is possible, but it is not easy. And it does not come from outside. It doesn't come from any school, from any master, outside. It doesn't come from a book or a guarantee or association with any group. It comes from intuitive action from the heart, from moment to moment. In other words, don't believe me. Awaken your consciousness. Change your life. This is something that only you can do. And it only can be done by following that voice of the silence, which is within. Do you have any questions? You mean how to undo them in what way? Um, both on the conscious and unconscious level. You mean for yourself or for society? Both. Ah. <laughs> that's a big job. Well, you remember in the scripture it says that uh, because that people has approached me with its mouth and honored me with its lips, but has kept its heart far from me, and its worship of me has been a commandment of men learned by rote. Truly, I shall further baffle that people with bafflement upon bafflement. And the wisdom of its wise shall fail, and the prudence of its prudent shall vanish. All those people in the media who are making music, making TV shows, making movies and books and magazines, they all believe they're good people. Many of them are religious. Many of them try to do their best to follow the commandments of their traditions. And yet, what they're creating is confusing humanity more and more. Why? Because God allows it. Because that is the law. Stated another way, in the book, The Gnostic Magic of the Runes, Samuel Vior said, 
When the gods want to punish humanity, first they confuse them. Our society is a great tower of Babylon, or a tower of Babel. Great confusion being added to every day. And all the priests and politicians are just making it worse from day to day, even if they have good intentions. Right? So your question is, how do we undo that? By following the commandments of your own inner God, this is the way. And respecting the law. You see, elsewhere in this book of Isaiah, Actually, just a little bit later, it says here that um, in that day the deaf shall hear even the written words, and the eyes of the blind shall see even in darkness and obscurity. Then the humble shall have increasing joy through the Lord. And the neediest of men shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. For the tyrant shall be no more, the scoffer shall cease to be, and those diligent for evil shall be wiped out, who cause men to lose their suits of law, laying a snare for the arbiter at the gate, and wronging by falsehood him who is in the right. Men will hallow in the Holy One of Jacob, and stand in awe of the God of Israel, and the confused shall acquire insight, and the grumblers accept instruction. In other words, yes, our society is in confusion. But this is the punishment of the gods. It will be resolved when that which must die is dead. And the book, has, the book says here, the humble will be exalted, the deaf will hear, and the blind will see. All of those are in us. We are deaf and blind and ignorant. But if we are humble, if we awaken the psyche through the power of Eros, do you remember that story from Greek mythology? Psyche sleeps, but who awakens psyche? Eros, the power of love. Christ is that. When that power of Eros awakens psyche, Psyche is there restored. In other words, our consciousness will be restored if we work through the heart. Our society will totally change. But that's not what's important here. What's important is the state of our own personal experience. We can't change the world. We can't even change ourselves. How are we going to change someone else if we can't change ourselves? You cannot. We all have the intention, the good intention, to want to help society and change society, but we cannot if we are the way we are. The only one that can do it is God. God can act through you if he has a way to do it. But as we are now, he cannot. Because we're asleep. Any other questions? The great... Uh, the great power of Gnosis is something that any one of us can grasp and can experience. It's something that you don't have to just believe in. It's something that you can taste and experience. But to do that requires your own inner psychological work. Absolutely. There's a, there's a number of things that we can do. The first action, the main one, is to make the effort to be aware and attentive at all times. To start working with the consciousness continually. This is the most important thing. Constantly. And this is something that has enormous depths. The consciousness has infinite degrees of development. It's not something that you'll practice for a little while and then get it and you're done. The development of attention and consciousness happens 
until you reach resurrection and after. It continues. So even the great gods still have work to do to develop consciousness. So it's a mistake to think it's just learning to be self-observant. This is akin to a baby who's first starting to crawl. Right? We need to become Olympians. Truly, Olympians, members of Olympus, gods. Right? So first we learn to crawl, and then walk, and then climb, and then run, and then jump, and then fly. So that's the first step. Everything else is secondary. Everything. But the secondary includes many practices and techniques. There are meditation practices, mantra practices, runic practices, and of course, transmutation. Many. But they're all a waste of time if someone is not awakening their consciousness through the heart. And this is a key thing, too. Even the demons awaken their consciousness. So just awakening is not enough. Black magicians, witches, sorcerers, all these types of uh, beings have awakened consciousness. They are awake. They see more than the physical world. They're able to travel out of the physical body consciously. They have powers. So what? They don't have the powers of the heart. This is the key. So you can't just try to develop powers and try to awaken consciousness. You have to awaken through the power of the heart, which is under the guidance of Leo, the guidance of Arie, Christ. Through that power in the heart, which is called bodhicitta. Is this kind of more the feeling, or is this, would you say it's beyond the uh, intellect? So it would come more as, as a feeling, or would it... Would it feeling, yeah. It, it's partly feelings. The thing is that the consciousness is the root of our being. And consciousness is an energy that can utilize everything that we are. Right? So when the consciousness is awake and active, it can use the body, it can use the personality, it can use the intellect, the heart, anything that makes up who we are. And the more that power of consciousness is developed, we start developing it physically, right? In Malkuth, the physical body. But the more it awakens, the more it starts to awaken outside the physical body also. So then we can start using the vital body consciously, then the astral body, then the mental body, then the causal body with the consciousness, because we start physically and expand that out. So the consciousness includes the use of thought, but consciously. So it doesn't mean that you stop thinking altogether unless you want to and need to. Then you do it. But you can't do that without consciousness. Right? Otherwise, thought just <laughs> just keeps going. How can you be a part of a society and not have an external vocation that possibly or actively contributes to its confusion, even if we are working through the heart? It seems so contradictory. I think in synthesis, the question is, how do we resolve the contradiction between our psychological and spiritual work and our role in the physical world, right? Like our job will often contradict our spiritual goals. Our job may contribute to the problems in society. Well, this is very common and understandable. And Samael and Vior gave very good advice about how to resolve this conflict. And he said, quite simply, change yourself. Don't try to change the external circumstances. Changing your job isn't necessarily going to fix your situation. But if you change your mind, change your heart, then you can resolve it. But that's something that cannot arise superficially. Stated another way, if your circumstances are unpleasant and you want to change the circumstances, then change what caused them. 
But you have to look for those causes inside, not outside. If you have a conflict with a family member or like in the question, maybe you feel conflicted about your job, meditate and comprehend the nature of that psychological conflict. Not to meditate on the external so much, but meditate on why you feel conflicted. And through that, intuitively, you can arrive at an answer. You see, there's no intellectual answer to this. Samael stated that the answer to the problem is in the problem itself. But that to resolve the problem, your mind cannot be in conflict. So if your mind is in conflict, in other words, your intellect is seeing contradiction, you cannot resolve it. You simply cannot. If you go along that track of the mind, comparing and analyzing the contradictions, you will only become more conflicted and more confused. The solution is to not think about it. it seems contradictory, but it actually can arrive, bring you to arrive at a solution. If you calm the mind, put the mind in a state of peace, the answer can arrive intuitively. But that's something that can't happen mechanically. You can't just go and say, well, I'm just going to quit my job or get another job or change the external. It won't change anything. Any other question? No? Okay. Thank you. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,